down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers Let's pause for a moment and pray. Lord Jesus, I'm humbled by that verse. I'm desirous, Lord, of preaching it accurately and faithfully. I'm desired that we as a church would hear it and receive it accurately, apply it faithfully, and for that we need your Holy Spirit to illuminate it and to empower us to live it. And we pray you would do that. Send your spirit among us. Empower your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In Phoenix, where I lived for a number of years, uh, there are a number of in and out burger locations. Uh, they've since invaded Texas, um, <laughs> clearly. Uh, but they were a big deal in Phoenix because they're a big deal in California. And uh, one time I was walking into In-N-Out Burger and I noticed a sign that at that point they had on their door. And it basically invited you to seek out any of their friendly employees. It was an invitation to ask or find any of our friendly employees. Now, I, I am something of an English nerd, okay? which if you want evidence of that, just talk to my friend Aaron and he will provide you with examples of why I'm an English nerd. But it struck me almost you know, quickly after reading that, that you know, there's two different ways you could understand that particular sentence. Uh, one way, which is kind of comical to think, is that they are categorizing some of their employees as friendly and others as not friendly, and they're encouraging you to only seek out the friendly employees and subtly declaring you do not want to ask any of our unfriendly employees. Um, you will not get the same result. I thought, you know, this would be a helpful experiment to go in and ask them, can you direct me to your friendly employees? <laughs> Uh, it's all about how you accent the sentence. Do you have friendly employees? Actually, uh, I don't want to talk to them. I'd like to talk to an unfriendly employee. Uh, please, uh, can I have an unfriendly employee? I'd like to see how they respond. Now, obviously, that is not what they mean. They don't mean that we have some friendly and some unfriendly, some happy and some grumpy. That is not what they're trying to say. They're trying to say, whoever you talk to will be friendly. Friendliness is just a character trait of every employee that works here. We just stuck it in there so that you know there is no question. Categorically, every employee will be what? Friendly. They will be friendly to you. You can't find an employee here that isn't a friend. If you want a friend, go to our store and you will find one. Friends are in abundance at In-N-Out Burger, apparently. And I thought, you know, it's interesting because that is a similar truth that God has displayed through his word over his church. And it runs the risk of a similar misinterpretation. Isn't it possible to think that there are loving Christians and then there are regular Christians? There are extra specially kind, warm-hearted, and compassionate people that sit in the chairs of churches, and then there are the rest of us. And God bless those loving, kind, gracious, compassionate people. They're the ones that greet you at the front door. They take baskets to people when they're sick. And then there are the other people that benefit from the friendly people. And you could understand the Christian church that way, but that is not what God intends when he writes 1 John 3.16 and actually a host of other verses about Christians. He means it the way the restaurant means it. My people are called to love. No exceptions, no love ministry that you can skip out of, 
No isolated Christians that have an extra love dose and the rest of us just come along and get along as best as we can. No, every Christian without exception has a calling proclaimed on their identity as a Christian. They are called to love and there's no escaping what God means by love. No two ways to understand this. You can't get out of it because you don't feel very loving and you don't want to have to be in that ministry. And you can't get out of it because you define love in some cultural way. No, no, God, God puts a definition right after that sentence. All of my people are loving. And just so we're clear, let me explain what love is. This morning we're looking at this powerful verse. And in effect, the teaching of this verse is we are to reflect the love we've received. We're to reflect the love we've received. That's the teaching of this verse. It, it transparently breaks down into two parts. First is a definition that God gives. We're going to call that receive the love of Christ. It's when God defines love by what Jesus did, and then there is an implication of that definition that Jesus, that, that, that John rather, works out, and he says, you ought to reflect the love of Christ. You're to receive this definition as God's definition for you, and then to reflect it. Receive and reflect, the two parts of this sentence. Let's, let's walk through this verse and, and just enjoy the richness of this teaching. First point, receive the love of Christ. Verse 16 begins this way. By this, we know love that he laid down his life for us. By this, colon, unchangeable, unalterable, God's definition, by this, we know love. Here it is, God's dictionary. This is how you know love. You want to know what love looks like? I'm about to tell you. Here is God's unchanging definition of the word love. Here it is, spelled out in living color, that he, Christ, laid down his life for us. That is the unalterable, unassailable definition of love. Unchanged by culture, God is not looking for a new definition. I, I, I told the church a number of months ago that I was fascinated and horrified to find that dictionary publishers, um, at least in some instances, have taken to believing that their job is simply to reflect the language of the culture. No matter how ridiculous that language becomes, they simply change the definition in order to reflect that. So I, I mentioned, uh, and it's worth mentioning again, that the word literal now has a new definition. Now, if there's a word that certainly is worth preserving, its original definition, wouldn't it be the word literal? I mean, where do you go from there? So they said, well, since people use it to mean particularly or emphatically or wow, that basically is what we have to mean now. So they said, for example, if a sports person says, he was literally on fire. <laughs> we now are going to change the definition. So that literally can mean especially or powerfully or wow or some such ridiculous definitional nonsense. That, that's going to be what it means now. So literal doesn't mean literal. And I thought if literal doesn't mean literal, where do you go from next? Does real mean fake? Does powerful mean weak? Does awesome mean pathetic? In some instances it does actually. That movie was awesome, for example. Here's the truth as Bible-believing Christians. God's definitions don't change. They don't succumb to cultural thinking. They're not impacted by how the world thinks. So, for example, if you look up the word love in the dictionary right now, the vast majority of what you will find is that love is a feeling towards someone. It's a feeling of affection. Love. A feeling of affection towards a particular person. God would say, great first half, but you need a second half of that definition. 
A feeling of affection, sure, fine, no problem. That is revealed by self-sacrifice for the other person's good. That is ultimately revealed in the love which has no rival and no equal, the laying down of the life of Christ for the sake of sinners. God's definition has the face of Jesus Christ right after the word love. Love, you know what it means? Jesus dying in place of sinners. Unchanging definition, never rewritable, always be the same from now and into heaven. Love. He laid down his life for us. Now we're going to talk about our love, like the verse does this morning, our love for others, and how we're to reflect in our small way what the definition of love is in heaven. We're going to talk about that this morning. But talking about our love has to flow out of receiving, receiving for the first time and receiving in fresh doses, the truth of God's love for us. Isn't that how John writes this verse? He first wants you to receive the good news of God's love for you. That the definition, think about this, the heavenly definition of love has you included in it. The heavenly definition of love has you included in it. Your salvation reveals the love of God. If you're a Christian, you being saved, you as the recipient, as the evidence of what it looks like to be loved is God's definition of love. Now think, think about the privilege of that. It's a humbling privilege because you're not the star of the show and neither am I. But your life is the canvas on which God has painted his own definition of love, namely the work of Christ. So let's think about this, this love and let's receive it. My, my burden this morning was that we would receive this in a fresh way. That, that anyone coming in, that maybe the, the love of God for them has become dim or distant, or maybe you've never meditated on the fact that God loves you. That I, I want this to be a, just a fresh enjoyment. It's only out of enjoying and receiving the love that God has given us in Christ that we can reflect it in any measure. If we're not meditating on the love we've received in Christ, we will reflect it very poorly. A mirror reflects what it looks at. And so we have to receive the love of God in Christ if we're going to reflect it in any measure at all. Let's think about the cost of God's love. He laid down his life. The he in that verse is the most beautiful, perfect, magnificent, glorious individual of all time who has ever lived, infinite in beauty and worth and majesty. Now, we are simply not prepared to think of ourselves as less valuable than anything. But there is someone we are less valuable than. It is the he in that sentence. My children like playing with bugs. And it disturbs me because I'm afraid of poisonous varieties of bugs. And I have squished some bugs in the backyard that I'm sure they would have liked looking at longer. Uh, but I have, out of fear, that they were going to die trying to enjoy this bug. Why? Because my children are more valuable than any bug out there. Now, it's an imperfect analogy because it doesn't quite get close enough to how much less valuable we are than God. It doesn't make us invaluable to say that because he is infinitely valuable, infinitely beautiful, infinitely righteous, Nothing you have ever seen or enjoyed 
wasn't the smallest reflection of how valuable he is. So when you read he, remember who the he is. And then couple that with the next part of that sentence. He did what? He laid down his life? Receive, remember, remember the beginning of this? This is love. This is love, colon. Open up your mind. Erase whatever definition is in there. Let this definition be imprinted. This is love. You want to know love? Here's what it is. He laid down his life. His eternal life, his incalculably valuable life, his incredible life, his perfect life, his glorious life, his worshipful life, his majestic life, his all-powerful life. What did he do? He laid down his life. For who? For us. The shock of that sentence to an angel is impossible to imagine. Humans live under the illusion of exaggerated value. We do all the time because we grew up listening to Disney songs and they are very effective at communicating exaggerated value. Now, I love Disney, and my children do, and we watch it all the time, but this is where they just are completely wrong. There is exaggerated value. Now, if you want to compare me to animals or bugs or trees, I am with you all the way, infinitely more valuable than any of those things. However, in the grand scheme of things, invaluable in comparison to him. And not only invaluable in our personhood. <laughs> Consider that why he had to lay down his life is because we have defiled even the image we were given. We started being minimally valuable, comparatively valuable on earth, and then we took that and we defiled it by sinning and defying God. We went from looking like God to increasingly looking like a snake. And so God came down in the form of his son and saw people who were increasingly bearing the image of a snake who defied God and deserved to be crushed. And instead of crushing them like a snake deserves to be crushed, who is endangering God's creation, he chose to be crushed in their place. Definition, colon, love. You want to know love? This is love. What parent among us would not die for their children? Certainly, without hesitation, you would die for your child. Absolutely. What person among us would die for someone who looks to destroy their children? None of us. That's what he did. By this we know love. He laid down his life. Not his leftovers. Not his extra. Not the change in his couch. Not an occasional glance. Not a pity gift. He laid down his life for you. On the cross, facing my guilt and shame and punishment and the crushing weight of the wrath of God for me. He stood there and received the accusations of holy justice for my sin and he heard the lash for my sin and he received the judgment for my pride and arrogance and selfishness and lust and he heard it poured out on his head and he said, I lay down my life under the crushing weight of God's wrath for you. You want to know what love is? It's Jesus dying on the cross for sinners who didn't deserve 
deserve to live. Receive the love of Christ. Receive it. By this we know what? Love. He, he didn't do this out of some obligation or duty. He was not obligated to save us. What, what do we know by this? Let's look now at the first definition. Love. By this we know love, not fairness, not rights, not justice in a human variety. No, no, by this we know love. By this we know love because nothing else could motivate a God to die for a person. The God to suffer for sinners. Receive the love of Christ. John Stott says the sending of God's Son was both the revelation of his love and indeed the very essence of love itself. It is not our love that is primary, but God's free, uncaused, and spontaneous. And all our love is but a reflection of his and a response to it. Let me, let me give you a couple of categories that I want to... I proclaim this first point to receive this first point receive the love of Christ proclaimed in the dictionary of God's unchanging truth this morning you you feel unloved if you feel unloved let me proclaim this truth receive the love of Christ this morning if you feel unloved you might feel unloved because you've been sinned against by people, because they've betrayed you, because they have let you down, because they have not returned to you what you have given to them you might feel unloved. Go there in your mind this morning. Where do you feel unloved? And let's let this incredible declaration fill that sense of emptiness and loss and pain. You might feel unloved because your marriage is difficult right now. You don't feel as though your spouse appreciates you the way he or she should. You might feel unloved because you've been betrayed by a particular person and it has created a bitterness or an anger or a frustration in your heart. You might feel unloved. You might, but let's go to this definition and declare this. By this we know love. Not because people treated us right or got us what we deserved, but because something much better than that has happened. Jesus laid down his life for you. If you feel unloved, turn your attention away from people. They're a poor choice to fill your need for love anyway and turn your attention to God and let him fill you with the joy of knowing Jesus laid down his life for you. Maybe you feel unworthy to be loved because of your sin and your failures, but the definition of love includes the payment for sin. Your sin renders you the right object of the love of God. God, the only kind of people that God saves are sinners. Your sin doesn't remove you out of the target of God's love. It means you're right in the center of the target of God's love because God's love is directed at sinners that he can die for. So if you're a sinner, good news, you are square in the center of the target of God's love. Or maybe you feel afraid to love. If you feel afraid to love, because you are afraid of how vulnerable it will make you. The solution is not to look at the recipient, the person you're thinking about loving, the person you're afraid to love, and to find in them some reason to love them and overcome your fears. That is never going to work. That is never going to work. Their deficiencies will always prove ample reason not to love them. But then you turn your eyes to Jesus 
and you receive the love of God in Christ and you realize you have a cup that is overflowing, you have a fountain that will never run dry, you have bread that never gets old, you have a home in the heavens, you have more than you can possibly contain of the love of God displayed in the cross of Christ and then you turn to this person and you say, why would I not want to let some of that love overflow from me to them? I don't need any reason in you to love you. I have all the reason in Christ to love you. So if you feel unloved or unworthy to be loved or afraid to love, receive the love of Christ. Receive it. It's true. No caveats. It never changes. God's not changing his dictionary. There it is. Here's the love of God. Christ laid down his life for you. No further proof needed. End of story. God loves sinners. Receive and once you are experiencing the sense of the fountain overflowing, then let's turn. Let's turn to what we should then do with this abundant sense of the love of God. We don't do nothing with it because we want to do something just as he did something. We reflect, we receive first, but then we reflect. We receive and we reflect. We ought to, it says, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Notice he uses the same language. He doesn't simply say, love our brothers. He says, lay down our lives. What's he saying? The definition of love doesn't change it remains the same, and in our way, we love in the same way that he loved. Now, important distinction, we're reflecting, we're not repeating. We're reflecting, we're not reproducing. We're reflecting, we're not replacing. We reflect the love of Christ, but we don't replace the love of Christ. Very important distinction. A mirror is not the ultimate thing, is it? Now, it's valuable, but it's not the ultimate thing. I don't become anybody's savior. Savior, but I love them in the same way that the Savior loved them. The church doesn't save anyone. Christians don't save other Christians, but they do reflect the self-sacrificing type of love that the Savior who gave himself for them reflected towards them. Reflect the love of Christ. You know, I think, uh, you tell me if you think this is accurate too. I think in our culture, uh, love has suffered from a devaluation. Um, it has become something like the first part of the Hippocratic Oath that doctors use. First, do no harm. Full stop. I think that's a lot of what people would say love is. Don't harm anybody. Feel good about people and don't harm anybody. As long as you don't hurt them, you're a loving person. You've satisfied the expectations. First, do no harm. But if a doctor only did no harm, would you go back? I mean, I wouldn't go back. Here's my symptoms, my issues, my challenges. I'm my ankle's broken and my head hurts and I, I can't breathe half most nights. And I have a large hole in the back of my head and my fingers are falling off and uh, it has been a difficult time walking uh, with my knee out of joint. Um, what can you do for me? Nothing worse. But many times that's exactly what Christians do. I won't make it worse. Okay. Can you make it better? You are after all a doctor. We are after all Christians.
Christians are called to reflect the love they've received, to reflect the love, not to replace it, but to reflect it, to reflect the love that they've received. So let's ask the question, how are our mirrors doing? Are they reflecting the love they've received? Or have they become foggy through disuse and they present a very distorted view of the Savior we should be gazing at? When people come to look at us in the love category, do they look and say, well, I guess that sort of looks like Jesus. I mean, it's foggy and confusing and seems a lot more disinterested in sacrifice and not really willing to help in the painful moments, but I guess there's some sort of resemblance there. No, that's not what we should want. We should want them to come to us and say, you know what you remind me of? You remind me of Jesus who died for my sins. I see him in you. When I think about you, I think about a savior who expired for the sake of sinners who breathed his last in their place. That's what I see when I see you, when I encounter you, I, I see him. I know you're not him, but I see him. There is a clear resemblance precisely in the area of sacrificial laying down of the life kind of love. How do we react? Let's ask this question of ourselves. How do we react when loving someone else means we have to give up something? Well, the first thing we need to do is go to this passage and realize loving, loving, definition, remember loving, loving, in God's mind, always means you give up something. To not give up something is to do something less than love. Another way to put that is if you're not sacrificing, you're not loving. If you're not feeling sacrifice, you're not loving. If you're not laying something down, we're not loving. If we are not losing, we are not loving. That is the definition. We ought to do what? Help them on occasion, encourage them when we can, find some leftovers. No, lay down our what? Leftovers, extras, occasional interest, when we can help. No, our what? Our lives. Our lives are to be one of continual outpouring first to the Lord, but then expressing that to his people. And notice that the recipients here are the brothers, the family of God. And that doesn't mean that we don't love others and love our neighbors and love the lost and want to care for them. There are other passages that speak very specifically to that, but I want to zero in on something that should definitely be present based on this verse. We ought to love those for whom Christ died in love. We ought to love those for whom Christ died in love. And doesn't that just make sense on a human level? I, I mean, if, if we look at the people around here and we say, Jesus was dying for them. He died for them. Can we love them? We should be able to. We should love to. Wait, wait, you... You're one of those people Jesus died for? What can I do for you? How can I help? What can I give up for your sake? The reality is life being laid down is a function of living in time. So if you're one of the people in the universe that don't live in time, um, then you're not laying down your life. Now, I, I know of only one person, and that's God, who doesn't live in time, okay? So I'm pretty sure everybody here lives in time. And if you think of it as one of these, these big grain feeders that they have, you know, dairy or something where they, they put poor feed, and imagine that it's broken, okay? Imagine that the, the stopper is just broken off the thing, and all of a sudden there's grain in here, but it's just going to come flowing out. And so we better hustle along the track here and make sure it just falls into each trough or else it's gone. I mean, we could pour it all in one place, but it's not going to stop pouring. It's just pouring. And so, oh my gosh, let's just start pouring. Where, where does it all go? Let's make sure it goes where it belongs. That's like life. We're constantly laying our life down because seconds are passing, right? Seconds are passing. Minutes are passing. Hours are passing. Days are passing. Years are passing. Life is being laid down. 
Can't help it, can't stop it, can't change it. Every moment, every second, life's being laid down. It's being laid down, laid down. There it is in a pile on the floor, a pile in the past, a pile of life just passed you by this week. It's just laying back there. There it is. We laid it down. The question is not so much whether we will lay our lives down as who we will lay our lives down for. You can't help but lay your life down. That's just a function of living. It's who are you going to lay it down for? And the scriptures tell us to lay down our lives in love to God and reveal that love to God by laying it down for our brothers, the family of God. Among other things, certainly. The world were to benefit through our work and through our labor. Martin Luther said, the milkmaid who milks the cow is serving those who drink the milk. That's a paraphrase, but basically that's what he said. So when you're working, you're, you're laying your life down to serve those who benefit from your labor, certainly. But we're focusing this morning on this community of the church. Let's imagine the grain feeder. How, how's the life being directed in laid down kinds of ways towards, or is it only directed towards the personal bin? Isn't that often what, what's the case? My personal bin is impressively stocked with life. It has been laid well. Life is overflowing in the personal bin. Personal time, personal entertainment, personal joy, personal ease, personal comfort, personal protection, personal happiness has been well stocked with life. I mean, hours and years and money and possessions have been poured in abundance into the personal bin. I am overflowing with life being laid into my personal bin. But then we go to 1 John 3, 16, and he says, we ought to lay down our life for who? For the brothers, for the brothers and sisters, for the family of God. And the definition of what that means is Jesus who died and literally expired on behalf of us and our brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the regrets I have from my childhood is a, a moment, um, I, I was playing basketball with my friends and I have two brothers, but I have a little brother, a number of years younger than me. And he wanted to play with us. And I don't remember everything that happened in the interaction, but I remember uh, what I felt after it was over. Somehow, I chose to either not defend him or include him when he wanted to be. And I remember walking away from that game and going up to my room and it striking me all of a sudden and just beginning to weep. And I thought, is that game? What was I doing? He's my little brother. What was I doing? Pouring life into the me bin that should have been poured into him. We're called to reflect the love we've received. That means a lot of life should be poured out of the me bin and into the brother's bin. Let me give you three categories for what an other's focused life of love, what contexts does this come in? First, it comes in the path of pain. Now, sacrifice is painful. We sacrifice our comfort, we sacrifice our money, we sacrifice our time to benefit others in our family and in our church, those Christians that God has, sacrifice itself is painful. But I, I mean more here when there has been a particular relational challenge in the past or anticipated in the future that makes it hard to love someone. That they have caused you or could cause you 
pain and perhaps even more so if you choose to love them more. That the more you love, the more you amplify your experience of vulnerability to their sin and their unloving nature. Nearly all of us have had that experience, some of us in extreme ways. And yet the reality is that it is in loving others that we experience the depth of our inability to do so because our fears grip our heart and we're consumed by fear of vulnerabilities to the other person's sin. And the only thing we can do in that moment of vulnerability is turn inward to protect ourselves or turn outward to gaze at Jesus. There is no other option. If you've been sinned against, you know this is true. When you reach that moment of vulnerability in the path of pain, there are two choices. You can turn inward and protect yourself or you can turn outward to Jesus because only by looking at Jesus do you receive the strength and the comfort and the confidence to love a person that makes you feel vulnerable. There is nothing in you. If, you. if you've never reached this wall, let me challenge us. If we haven't reached this wall of impossibility, we're not facing the real cost of real love yet. Because every person I've ever known, myself included, when you, when you talk about really loving, especially someone who makes you feel vulnerable, I'm not talking about safety issues here. I'm just talking about the normal life of loving people that where it's hard to do so. It forces you. I have no other option. I'm either not going to love them or I'm going to have to cry out for the Lord Jesus to reveal his love for me. Because unless he pours in, I'm not going to be able to pour out at all. And yet that's where the life is. Sometimes I think God brings us to these vulnerable opportunities so that we will look to him for a fresh infilling of the experience of his love. I, I think that's why God does that. He points us to a moment that's like, I can't love that person. Do you know how vulnerable they make me feel? Do you know how many times they've sinned against me? Do you know what it's really like to love them? How dangerous that makes my, my heart feel because of their anger or their bitterness or their selfishness. I, I, how could I possibly love that person? And God says, the only way is if you know me better. The alternative is selfishness, and selfishness turned into a God of safety eventually leads to destruction. Selfishness turns into a God of safety eventually leads to destruction. The path of protecting yourself with selfishness and lack of love will finally destroy you. C.S. Lewis says it this way. There is no safe investment. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. This is John's point actually throughout this book. Loving others reveals that we have been loved in salvation by Christ and we know it. Hating others or protecting ourselves from love of others reveals that we have a different God than the God Son who was crucified in our place. If we want life, we find that by looking to him and loving like he did. Love in the path of pain. Two others quickly. Love in day-to-day -day life. 
day-to-day life, and I want to point this specifically in the category of the church because that's what John does, the brothers. The brothers, love and day-to-day life. Let me encourage you, find a way to sacrifice for your brothers and sisters in day-to-day life. Find ways to do it. Find a way to sacrifice for your brothers and sisters in day-to-day life. Make sacrificial love a rhythm. You could sacrifice your time. You could make a phone call when you're busy. We can find little ways of blessing people financially. We can find ways of encouraging them when they're down, of comforting them when they're weak, of challenging them when they're struggling. We can find ways of sacrificing our tendency, which is to pour all of our life and lay it into the self bin and begin to pour some life into the other's bin and lay down our lives for others the way Jesus laid down his life for us. That happens with our speech. It happens when we listen. It happens when we give. It happens when we welcome. It happens when our our home is made a a place of refuge for others and not just for ourselves. It happens when our, our words are used to bless others, not just talk about ourselves. It happens when our money is used to pay for others and not just for ourselves. It happens when we pour out the life we have toward others and give to them as a small reflection of how Jesus poured out his life for us. Find ways of doing this in your day-to-day life. Lives are built by individual decisions. Lives are built by individual decisions. You will not come to one great moment of love and choose spontaneously to make that your great pinnacle of loving others. You will only do that if you've made little decisions along the way to sacrifice a moment here or a longer conversation there or a welcome into your home there or a gift here and you've built your life that pouring out for others is a part of your identity. Lives are built by small decisions. Character is built by small decisions. Love is built one small decision at a time. Day-to-day life. This is actually a major reason we have small groups in this church. It's a major reason. It's a major reason that in those small groups, we have once a month time where we just gather as families, kids included, so that we can love one another. We can bring food to one another. We can encourage each other. We can find out about what's going on in our life so that our love can be specific to the need. That's why we would encourage you to join these these gatherings so that you can love others. Yes, so you can receive, but also so you can love, you can find out, you you can hear and you can encourage, you can find specific ways. Show me the target. Show me where your bin is right now so that I can pour out some love. If I don't know you, it's much more challenging to love you in the most meaningful ways. final category of way we can pour out love is in the gatherings of the church. It says here we're to love our brothers. I think we can do that in private and day-to-day interactions, one-on-one. I think we can do that when the church gathers. Every ministry in our church is simply a way to worship God and love the members of our church. We, we don't have any purely practical ministries. We're, we're not building widgets, okay? That's not what we're doing. We're, we're, not, we're not building things around here. This is all about people. So the ushers come and they set up chairs, not because we think chairs are nice, but so the people can sit. They're loving people and loving them by giving them the chance to sit and not stand when they hear God's word preached. When you give money, you're loving people by providing for a building and for pastoral ministry and things like that. The the worship team comes early, not because they're just looking for a gig, but so that they can serve other people and play for them and and help us to enjoy singing in unison and together and relatively in the same key all the time, right? I mean, that's, that's the goal of the worship team. The sound team amplifies sound so that we can hear all the different instruments and the drums don't take over everything and the piano can be heard as well. And I mean, right, we, we, we hear this wonderful balance when they come together and even electronic instruments can be heard and, and singers can be heard and, and there's this glorious thing where they all play together. Every person on the music team does what they do to love the rest of us. The drummer keeps time so that we're on the same meter. The piano player comes in with some harmony so we can enjoy the gift of music. And that's the way every part of the church is. Children's ministry is loving other members of the church. Their children by speaking the gospel to them and the parents by giving them an undistracted moment to hear from God's word. The website team and the 
uh, the visual team, they're, they're loving us by reinforcing what we're singing and by reinforcing what we're learning. Every ministry in the church is trying to obey loving the brothers. We've got to keep that in view. Otherwise, we start to be practical. This is just a task. It's not a task. It's loving people. And that's what we do because we've been loved much more than we will ever love. I think my favorite author for a Christian to read is Jerry Bridges. I've said that many times. If you've never read him, come tell me and I will buy you. We will buy you a Jerry Bridges book if you've never read one. Okay? The financial guys are worried right now. I, I don't care. If I have to pay for them, I will. I, I will buy you one, okay? I'll buy your family one at least. I will, we'll, we'll buy you a Bridges book. But here, here's something that Bridges says just to close about love. He's quoting another man, and then I think he adds some of his comments as well. Let's just quote just wash over us and motivate us to cry out to the Lord. Love is a vigorous spirit that rules the whole man, ever directing him to the humble and loving fulfillment of his duties to God and man. We should do more than just decide to do acts of love. We should desire to do them. This is not to say we are to do acts of love only when we feel like doing them. It is to say we are not to content ourselves merely with acts of the will, good as those acts may be. We are to lay hold of God in prayer until he gives us that vigorous and loving spirit that delights to reach out and embrace our brother and meet his need or forgive his sin, even if it is at great cost to ourselves. It is obvious that the love we have been considering can be produced in our hearts only by the Spirit of God. So let's seek the Holy Spirit now and ask him to do this work in each of us. Lord God, I, I come to you with my own deficiencies. And I just want to begin, Lord, by confessing Lord, where you have brought conviction to my heart in this passage. Lord, so often I'm more about protecting and providing for my preferences than I am about loving those that you've died for. Lord Jesus, I just pray you would change us. I pray you would make us like you. Help us to be good mirrors, <laughs> reflecting your image. Lord, help us to pour out our lives in, in joyful worship of you. And, and, and I pray also, Lord, that for all of us, what we would be most aware of is the love we have received, the incredible love we've received. Lord, I pray for anyone who feels unloved or unworthy to be loved or afraid of love, that you would just pour out the assurance of your love for them revealed in the gospel that for anyone who has believed in Jesus, they have the ultimate truth displayed in scripture of your love for them, Lord. Cause their heart to be filled with the knowledge of the love of God. Lord, I pray for anyone here who is not a believer, who does not know you as Savior, Lord, I pray right now you would cause them to call out for your love, to cast their lives on your love, to come to you empty and needy and request that you would fill them with the assurance of your saving love in Christ. Would you do that in every heart? Cause them to believe in you right now and cause us to have the, the courage and the power and the passion to love one another as you have loved us. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the privilege of loving one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.